there, fellow. This is Miss History with another bizarre history tidbit. We will look at a man who never got the chance to gloat. A man who won a race and didn't even notice. This man's name was Frank Hayes. Hayes was born in 1888 into an Irish-American family in Brooklyn, New York. From a very young age, he knew his life was destined to be spent around horses. He lived in downtown Brooklyn with his mother and sister, but he was rarely ever at home. He spent most of his time and energy racing horses, but... Frustratingly enough, he never made it as a first-rate jockey. The 35-year-old Hayes had never won a race before, and in fact, his profession was not actually a jockey, but a horse trainer and longtime stableman for the horse breeder, James K. L. Frailing. James saw potential in the Brooklynite as a trainer of thoroughbreds. While Hayes enjoyed schooling horses, many of them race winners, his passion was to be the rider to win the races, rather than watch from behind with a pair of binoculars. When a victorious jockey would come into the winning enclosure after a race to a joyous reception, Hayes, the mastermind behind the victory, quietly cooled down the horses and led the beast back to the stable while the jockey took the prize. At the start of June 4th, 1923, Hayes saw an opportunity to ride one of the horses he had been training for a race in Belmont Park. The bay mare, Sweet Kiss, was the horse of Miss A.M. Frailing, and she wanted to see her horse ride out onto that New York track on June 4th. However, she was finding it hard to get a jockey at such short notice. Hayes offered to ride, but she declined, stating his weight would ruin his chances of even finishing in the top five. But Hayes persisted, and eventually, after much persuasion, Miss Frailing agreed to let him ride Sweet Kiss. Almost immediately, Hayes set in motion an extreme weight loss campaign in order to meet weight requirements for the race. In just a matter of days, he slimmed down from 142 pounds to 130 pounds. Can you imagine that? In about a week, slimming down 12 pounds? When race day came, Hayes decked himself out in the racing silks of Miss Frailing. In the jockey's room at Belmont, his counterparts would later recall how excited he was to finally debut as a jockey at the age of 35. When the horses and riders gathered at the starting post, Hayes turned to his fellow jockeys and remarked, Today is a good day to make history. The starter waved the flag and began the race, and history indeed was made. The seven-year-old mare was leading by just ahead, and the spectators rose to their feet as the 20 out of one shot beat Gimme. Hayes was slumped forward on his horse as they passed the winning posts, and many thought he had been whispering into his mare's ears. The horse continued to run before easing into a canter for another hundred yards, and eventually, Hayes, who was now slumped over his horse's neck, toppled over onto the ground face first. The track physician, Dr. John A.H. Voorhees ran to the scene and declared the jockey dead of possible heart failure. It was suggested that the fatal heart attack may have been brought on by Hayes' extreme weight loss and possibly followed by the excitement of riding into the front of the pack. The story was considered unbelievable. Here was this outsider, a 20 out of one shot who had taken the lead near the end of the race and managed to hold on to it while carrying a dead body. But the result went without contest and as mark of respects to Frank Hayes, Belmont's Jockey Club declared him the winner. About three days later, Hayes was buried in the silks he wore on his first and only win. The history he had spoke about making indeed transpired, and to this day, he remains the only dead man to win at a competitive sport. This time, we will be focusing on the toxic woman. When Gloria Ramirez was brought to the Riverside General Hospital on February 19, 1994, the staff assumed her issues were simply related to her advanced stage of cervical cancer. She was in pain, confused, suffering from poor breathing, and had an incredibly high pulse. The staff took their usual action, giving Ramirez sedatives, and eventually restoring to defibrillating her. It was around this time that they began to notice something even stranger about their patient. Ramirez's body was covered in an oil-like substance, and she smelled the fruit and garlic, which some of the staff blamed on her breath. One of the RNs in the room tried to draw blood from Ramirez, only to notice an ammonia smell coming from her blood. Smelling ammonia under normal circumstances is bad enough. Noticing it coming from someone's blood? A little bit alarming for even the most seasoned of nurses. The RN passed on the syringe to a resident, blood still inside. The resident noted particles floating around in the blood. The RN who passed on the syringe fainted and had to be removed 
from Ramirez's bedside. Soon after, the resident began to feel nauseous. In her state, she calmly moved outside to sit at a nurse's desk. After a few moments, she had also passed out. Soon, a third person assisting Ramirez passed out. After about 35 minutes of a crew continuing to work on the patient, despite these alarming occurrences, Ramirez passed away due to kidney failure related to her advanced cancer. Some scientists say that the staff were simply suffering from mass hysteria, but the staff fervently deny this. The resident affected spent two weeks in the ICU, developed hepatitis, and had breathing problems. Another scientist believed that Ramirez may have been using a home degreaser as a pain reliever, which could have created a gas in the room, causing the workers pain. To this day, Ramirez's family, the workers, and the investigators have not solved the mystery of the toxic woman, Gloria Ramirez. Today we'll be talking about the guy who wouldn't quit. Elmer McCurdy was not the type of man one would expect to remain infamous over a hundred years after his death. Born in 1880, even his arrival in the world was a bit strange. His mother, Sadie McCurdy, was only 17 years old at the time of his birth, and she was unmarried. Sadie's brother and his wife adopted Elmer and raised him. Not long after Elmer's father died, Sadie admitted to being Elmer's mother. Shocked and traumatized by this revelation, Elmer went from a normal child to a teen alcoholic, prone to acting out. Elmer then moved in with his grandmother and found work as an apprentice plumber, which was a job he excelled at. He made a comfortable living for quite some time, but in 1898, the economic downturn that had begun in 1893 made its way to the McCurdy household. Elmer then lost his job. Within three years, Elmer's mother and grandfather died, and Elmer, no longer able to hold a job, began drifting around the Northeast, offering his services as a miner and plumber whenever possible. Eventually, Elmer ended up in Missouri, where he had joined the Army. There, he was trained in the use of nitroglycerin, one of the most popular explosive material at the time. After his honorable discharge, Elmer began to use his skills to help him burglarize homes, people, and trains. At one point, Elmer and a friend were even arrested and sent to trial for possessing tools used for burglary. They were able to convince the judge that the tools they were using was for a machine gun they were inventing. After leaving the trial, Elmer began a stint as a train and bank robber. Although the limited training he had received in nitroglycerin often meant that his robbery attempts were less than professional. Once, attempting to blast the safe door off, Elmer used way too much nitroglycerin, causing most of the money and goods inside the safe to be destroyed. In another attempted robbery, Elmer's charge failed to ignite, leaving the would-be robbers to scrounge whatever cash they could find that wasn't locked up. Hardly the stuff of Jesse James. Elmer's next attempt took place in October 1911. He and two friends heard that a train was coming through and it would be carrying $400,000 in cash. The men quickly stopped a train, but then discovered that it was only a passenger train. They managed to eat $46 out of the people on board and two large bottles of whiskey, which Elmer quickly commandeered. Elmer holed up in a barn with his whiskey he was ill and drunk when the police showed up to make good on the $2,000 reward on his head. On October 7th, he was shot and killed. Now this is where the story gets truly bizarre. Elmer's body was taken to a funeral home and left unclaimed. Joseph Johnson, the owner of the home, embalmed the body with a preservative that kept his features and body intact. When months stretched by without the owner receiving payment from a relative for his services, he decided to start exhibiting the body to make back his costs. The body of the bandit who wouldn't give up became far more popular in attraction than Johnson could have ever dreamed. In fact, he soon was attracting offers from carnival owners for the purchase of McCurdy's body. Johnson refused these offers, but then, five years later, two men claiming to be McCurdy's brothers showed up. Unable to refuse them, Johnson handed the body over. The men were actually James and Charles Patterson, owners of a carnival. They featured McCurdy's body for seven years, at which point the carnival was sold, wholesale, to Louis Sony. When Louis Sony died, the body was placed in storage. It made an appearance in 1967's movie, She Freak, with his son's permission. It was sold to a few other oddity displayers throughout the 1960s and 70s. At some point, it was left hanging inside the amusement park's funhouse. McCurdy's body was rediscovered by a television crew in 1976. After a long examination, 
It was re-identified as McCurdy. After 75 years of out exhibits, displays, and many shows, McCurdy's body was finally laid to rest. They had to cover it in two feet of concrete to dissuade any possible grave robbers. I'm Miss History signing off. So t-